Let me be the first to just say good morning and welcome to Southridge Church. We're excited to see each and every one of you on this amazing Sunday morning. I love the fall overcast weather. I love being with you and worshiping our great God and Savior together in this place by his stripes we are healed there is healing this morning i don't know what you are suffering discouraged and burdened from but there is healing by his stripes we are healed amen well i want to welcome you to this place thank you for being here well done for making a church this morning and take your bible if you have one to john chapter number nine if you don't have it just look up on the screen as we'll put uh, the passage up on the screen. We are concluding a five-week series entitled, Who is Your One? I believe it's no accident that God put you on this earth when he did put you on this earth. I believe that you and I have a calling and more than a calling. We have a responsibility to reach those that are around us and tell them about Jesus Christ. And so we together, as a church, as a community, we have a mission. And our mission is leading people to find and follow Jesus. We want you to find Jesus, experience life in Him, but then also we want you to be a part of helping others find Jesus as well. People are searching for many things these days. You can uh, just watch the landscape and see what people are searching for. They're searching for promotion, finances. They're searching for uh, a relationship. They're searching for houses and position. But ultimately, our hearts will not rest until they rest in Him. And so that's why we want to get that message out to everybody. We kicked off this series by saying the fact that we are rescued to rescue others. We learned what real faith looks like. We realized that we need to focus on finding sheep. And then we learned last week that Jesus is the friend of sinners. It's easy to be a friend to somebody who is nice and friendly, but Jesus wasn't looking for that, was he? He just said, I'll be the friend to sinners. And what a powerful, powerful truth that is. Well, let's go to John chapter number nine. I don't want to hold us too long today. We've got much that is going to be happening today. So let's dive right into the word of God this morning. But as we open to John chapter number nine, let me open with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I love you. I love this place. I love these people. I pray that you would take your word and would you do a great work with it and through it. And Lord, we just look forward to all that you're going to do this morning. I pray that the word of God would speak to each and every heart. Holy Spirit, would you go up and down these rows and would you begin to break down any barriers that would limit what your Holy Spirit wants to do. I pray that we would have hearts that are surrendered and open to your voice. I pray that you would do great things in our midst, in this place, that we would walk out forever changed. I pray if there's somebody here that's not saved, that today would be that day that they give their life to Christ. We look forward to all that you're going to do. In Jesus' name we pray and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. All right. John chapter number 9, verse number 1 says this, and Jesus was walking along, and he saw a man who had been blind from birth. Rabbi, his disciples asked him, why was this man born blind? Was it because of his own sins or his parents' sins? It's an interesting question for the disciples to ask, because the man was born blind. How can you sin before you were even born? It's an interesting question. The disciples were known for asking questions that, weren't all that well thought out. I think I've been guilty of asking questions like that. <laughs> hey, hon, I can't find the food that you asked me to get in the pantry. And she just, right there. Oh, it's there. It was invisible before, and it's now visible, you know? We're guilty of asking dumb questions. My mom would always say, there's no such thing as a dumb question, just dumb people, you know? So I was like, thank you, mom. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, that explains a lot of therapy sessions for me. That just kind of, uh, that's it. Sums it all up. Actually, Mom, I don't know if you really said that. I just, I, I lied. I don't know. Maybe you said it. Verse number three. I love what Jesus says. Jesus says this. It was not because of his sins or his parents' sins. I think sometimes you and I will go through life and something bad will happen. You'll get sick. You'll get in a car accident. And immediately you'll want to go to something bad you may have done. And say, oh, God's punishing me. I did this. There's a difference between punishment and consequences. We studied that a couple weeks ago. 
But I find it amazing that we kind of go back in our mind, we'll live in this past guilt trip, and we're blaming something that happened. And Jesus right here is saying, hey, no, 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 that's, that's not what's going on. It was not because of his sins or his parents' sins. Jesus answered, this happened so the power of God could be seen in him. We must quickly carry out the tasks assigned to us by the one who sent us. The night is coming, and then no one can work. But while I am here in the world, I am the light of the world. Then he spit on the ground and made mud with the saliva, and he spread the mud over the blind man's eyes. He told him, go wash yourself in the pool of Siloam. Siloam means sent. So the man went, washed, and came back seeing. People today are crying out to be noticed and help with their needs. Uh, Jane and I just got back late last night about midnight from a funeral for my Oma. That's uh, German for grandmother. And uh, it was interesting. As we were on the flight leaving Chicago to get here, sit down and, and you look over the guy next to you and the other guy. And then you just start, you know, picking up small, small talk. And so you, you know, talk to the one guy, what are you out here for? I'm out here for work. What, is, what are you out here for? I'm out here for a funeral. And I said, oh, it's interesting. So am I. So am I. You know, the, the story about my Oma was she immigrated to the United States when she was just 25, didn't speak the language. Her and her husband came over with really nothing. And anybody that's had uh, parents or grandparents that have immigrated, you, you'll know that uh, then you just you didn't bring anything. There's just nothing. You were allowed one box. That's it. One box. Um, and they came over, you know, you don't have much, and then you go through life just trying to figure things out in a new country, you know, and, and start to have a family, start to get a life for you, and then your five-year-old son gets hit by a car and dies. Tragic. Heartbreaking. And then shortly thereafter, she loses her husband. He was just 47. But she has four kids still to take care of. One who was only, uh, she was seven months pregnant with her. She was seven months pregnant, loses her husband. Doesn't speak the language, doesn't have a job, but now she has three children and one on the way to take care of. Incredible woman. She ended up being a supervisor at Briggs & Stratton in Milwaukee. Do you know what type of men in the 70s worked at steel mills at Briggs & Stratton? You know what type of woman you would have to be to be a supervisor and be telling all of these Milwaukee Guys, like, I mean, California, we got men. But you go to the Midwest, up in the Rust Belt, that's a different breed. That's a different breed. I mean, they just, they, they, they're a whole different level, right? And she became a supervisor, worked at Brigham Stratton for 30 years. All of her children went to a Bible college. She kept them in church. She ran a children's after-school Bible club in her backyard. She taught Sunday school every Sunday. And then she would collect, back in the day, coffee came, not in bags, but these little tins. Come on, how many remember the tins? Little Maxwell House tins? Oh, yeah, yeah. She would go to her church and say, hey, give me your coffee tins. And you would go into her basement, and there would be stacks of these coffee tins. You say, was your Oma a hoarder? No. She would start in about August baking cookies. She would hold them in her deep freezer. She'd put the cookies in these tins, pack them up, and she would ship them to pastors, missionaries, and people she liked all over the world. She, people would write about them because they, were, they would write about these Christmas cookies that she would just send. And she was just an amazing woman. My brother and I, we were talking, and we were like, man, weren't those cookies amazing? And he said, yeah, yeah, yeah. He said, I'm in Indiana, and I meet this guy who said, I know your Oma. Man, she made the best cookies. He was like, I know. Isn't it a bummer that those stopped? And the guy was like, what do you mean the cookie stopped? He was like, I just got mine last year. And my brother and I looked at each other, and we said, the cookie stopped for us like a decade ago. <laughs> were we like bad grandkids or something? She was just like, I don't like you, you know? Like, what happened? Because our friends still got their cookies, but we didn't get our cookies, you know? Just, just, just an amazing woman. And at her memorial service yesterday, you saw all the neighbors started showing up. You saw all these people that showed up that helped this woman in her time of need because they, they noticed you know, today we get going and we get so busy, we don't notice the needs of people around us. And the disciples didn't notice the needs of this blind man, did they? They did something that you and I kind of do. 
Instead of noticing that they have a need and helping them, they did the exact opposite. What do they do? They break into a discussion about his dysfunction. They were like, hey, Jesus, here's this guy. What evil, wicked sin did he do? He's blind, not deaf. So he can hear this. He can't see you to swing at you, but he can hear you. And don't think like, oh, man, maybe this is like, you know, kind of a daredevil thing. Maybe he got like superpowers. No, he did not. He's sitting here begging. He's blind. He's a grown man. Later in this passage, we will hear that he is of age. So his whole life growing up, he grew up as a blind person. Now, understand the day and age that he lived in. There was no Braille. There was no seeing eye dogs. There was no way to say, hey, you're going to learn how to live an independent life. We're going to help you. There's certain schools. No, no Helen Keller. This is a beggar who sits by the side of the road begging for whatever he can get, and that's how he exists. And here the disciples are talking about, what kind of sin did this guy do? Because this is really sad. And was it his sin, or was it his parents' sin? Please get this this morning, church, because this is so pivotal to the heart of who we are as a body. You see, you can debate a person's dysfunction, or you can make a difference, but you can't do both. Some of us get so busy debating why somebody is the way they are instead of just saying, who cares? They need help. They just need help. Why are we having this discussion? And Jesus is setting the record straight. They want a discussion and Jesus like, let's make a difference. Hey church, we can get into our little holy huddle and we could talk about how the world is going to hell in a handbasket. That's an old word. We don't use it a whole lot. But we could just say, oh, man, don't like the politics. Don't like the direction. Don't like this. Or we can go and do something about it. But you can't do both. And too often we are guilty of talking about things we're never actually going to do. How many projects have you started that are still left undone? How many things have you talked about? How many places have you thought about going? How many things have you thought about doing? How many times have you come to January and you've made these New Year's resolutions only to find that by January 4th, you've already given up on them? Because we're very good at discussing things and never making a difference. And that's why people look at the church and they say the church is irrelevant because we are too busy discussing things instead of doing things to make a difference. You see, the disciples wanted a discussion. Jesus wanted to make a difference. The disciples were asking the question. And it's the same question the man had been asking his whole life. The question is this, the disciples are asking, did he sin or his parents sin that he was born blind? How many times do you think this little boy went to his mommy and said, mommy, why don't my eyes work? How many times as a little kid do you think he ran into a wall, he fell down, he got hurt, and he would tell crying with tears in his eyes, and he would say to his mom, he'd say, mommy, why, why can't I play with the other kids? Mommy, the other kids get to go swim by the river, and I can't go there. Mommy, I hear the other kids, they, they're going to the school. Can I go with the other kids? His whole life, he had been asking the same question that the disciples are asking him. And we do the same thing. We are asking the wrong question, aren't we? Not why is he like this, but what do we need to do to make this different? Here we're looking at our neighbors and saying, why are they so angry all the time? They're asking themselves the same thing. Do you know that? The person who's hooked on a substance is asking himself the same thing. Why can't I quit this? The addict is asking themselves, why can't I break free? The person who hops from relationship to relationship is saying, why can't I just have a relationship that works out? And here we come in as the Christians just like, man, if they would just fix their relationships, they'd be a pretty cool dude. If they would just clean themselves up, I would actually be their friend. Do you see we're asking all the same question that they're asking and we need to change the question? And until the church starts asking a different question, we will never see a difference in our city. And we've got to start asking a different question. The question is this, what can I do to be part of the solution? 
Because this debating, this discussing, it's not getting us anywhere. And the church will never see the forward progress and the momentum that we want to see until we start saying, what does my city need? What does my neighborhood need? Hey, what does my church need? Because I show up and I love the worship and I love to sit here, soak it in and leave right afterward. But what does my community need? There's a great statement. I'd love for you to write it down. And it's this statement. See the need and take the lead. How many times did you grow up in the home where you're sitting there, you're watching TV, you're playing video games, or you're just doing nothing, and one of your parents walks in and says, did you not see the dishes in the sink? And then you're like, no, I, I never had <laughs> dishes. What are dishes? Do you not see the laundry that needs to be folded? I don't wear clothes. I just, let's get back to the Garden of Eden. Do you not see that this needs to be done and that needs to be done? And you're just like, well, I did. I just ignored it. I believe Jesus is saying, do you not see it? And then you do what I'm guilty of doing. We just pretend like we didn't see it. And it's heads down. And I'll tell you, yes, it takes no emotional effort. It takes no work, no time out of your day to just scoot on by the situation. But do not lie to yourself and do not lie to your small group and do not lie to your family and do not lie to anybody else and say, I want to make a difference in the world. And yet you close your eyes to the needs around you. Because the moment you open your eyes to the needs, can I tell you something? The needs that God's going to bring to you are not the pretty ones. You know this need right here? The disciples, you know why they would rather discuss it? They didn't have a solution for it. So when you don't have a solution for it, you're like, well, let's just debate it. Because that, after all, will get us nowhere. But at least we felt like we did something. And so you and I, we are hesitant to get involved in the situation because we don't have the answers. Can I tell you, that is ministry 101. I never know the answer. And can I tell you this? My job is not necessarily to have the answer. My job is just to show up in that space and be the hands and feet of Jesus. And that is your responsibility. Jesus even told his disciples, hey, don't worry about what you need to say. Because God will give you the words to say when you need to know it. Just you show up and just say, okay, I'm here to help. What can I do? And if what I can do is watch the kids while you go out or do your dishes or do your laundry or simply help you with some finances or is it to help you with this? Then you start making a difference. But you've got to start asking a different question. We as a church have to start asking a different question about our community. Not, what did my councilman do for me? What is my mayor going to do for me? What is this? If you peel that back, that is a self-centered question. Because at the heart of it is me. And at the heart of the gospel is not me, it's others. That's the heart of the gospel. The heart of the gospel is what are we doing for those around us? God didn't make him like this. And many times we're looking around and saying, oh, maybe God did this. No, God didn't. But I love what Jesus says in verse 3. He says this profound statement. It is not because of his sins or his parents' sins. Jesus answered, this happened so the power of God could be seen in him. I want to give you a tough but true statement. No problems, no power. No problems, no power. Your problems are the conduit through which God's power flows. God said, this problem, it's so my power can work. You and I are trying to create a life free from all problems. And I get it. You're like, I need to pad the 401k. I need to make sure my retirement is set. I want to make sure the kid's college. I don't want to have any debt. I want to have some things in reserves. And guess what? I'm going to move to a really safe neighborhood. And if I can't get in a safe neighborhood, I'm going to build a really high fence. And if I can't build a really high fence, I'm going to get really good cameras. And then I'm going to buy a really big gun. And I'm going to get all the toilet paper and canned goods from Costco. And I'm going to have a little bunker in my backyard. 
So I'm safe and insulated from everything that's out there. Instead of simply saying, you know what? Maybe my problems are so I can see another level of God's power in my life. So I can see God do something in my life that I never thought possible. You see, your problem cannot stop God's power. But many of us look at our problems and say, oh, that's too big for God. Because that's what the disciples did. They said, this guy's blind. Which means his blindness from birth, the synapses in the back of his eyes weren't connected to his brain. He had eyes, but there's nothing connected. So he can't see. So how do you do synaptic regeneration? There's no surgery for this. There's no eye transplants for this. There's nothing that these disciples could do, but there was something that Jesus knew could happen. And Jesus is looking at it. And Jesus is saying, no, no problems, then you have no need for my power. So if you're trying to rid your life of all problems, you're ridding your life of all that God wants to do and show up. Because life is never problem free. But as you go through the problems, you realize just how great God is. Stop debating with yourself and deciding what degree of difficulty is too much for God. You're like, well, you don't understand my student loan. That's not too hard for God. Well, you don't understand. I'm I'm tired of being single. That's not too hard for God. Oh, you don't understand. We're trying to have children. That is not too hard from God. I was praying for years, for years, that Lydia and Ed would have children. They've been trying for four years, and I just found out two days ago that they're now expecting their first child. I've prayed for that for years. Nothing's too hard for God. Nothing's too hard for God. You say, well, I have this diagnosis. That's not too hard. That degree of difficulty is not too hard for God. We've got to understand that our God is a healing God. We've got to understand that our God is a powerful God. We've actually got to find and meet the God of the New Testament. Because all throughout it, you'll see that he does amazing things. And he uses ordinary people. We've got to move. We don't have a lot of time. If you're taking notes, you can write this down. This may help you later. Problems are like a magnet that draws God's power to it. The mustard seed is greater than any mountain. Because mountains don't have a growth potential, but a mustard seed does. Secondly, I love this. Verse number seven, Jesus told him, go wash in the pool of Siloam. Siloam means sent. So the man went. If you're taking notes, write that down. He went. He went. I love this. Siloam means sent. Jesus is the sent one. And he goes, and he's going to go to this pool, to wash. But think about it, he's blind. Did Jesus say, hey, Peter, Andrew, Bartholomew, go with him, guide him? It doesn't say that, does it? As a matter of fact, it just says go. You know why this is so powerful? You and I can't make a decision for anybody else around us but us. My dad was a pastor since I was born. Him being a pastor did not make me a Christian. I had to make that choice alone. Your healing, your husband can't do it for you. Your wife cannot do it for you. Your children cannot do it for you. I am tired of Christians saying, well, my mommy and my daddy, they're this, or my aunt, my uncle. I meet so many people that they're like, well, I've got a distant relative who's a pastor. I'm like, that means nothing. You're going to bet your eternity on that? Don't do it. This is a trip you got to take alone. And this guy went. He still did it. You know how dangerous it is for a blind man to leave the one area that they know? That is a dangerous thing because he found a spot where he either it's close to where he lives or that is where he lives. And his whole life is right there. He knows that there's a close source of water there. He knows there's a close source of food right there. And he knows this is the spot where I can get the most alms. This is where I live. And some of us have gotten so accustomed to our little spot where we live, and we're just used to it. And we won't leave it, even though it is not where God wants you to be. And even though God has so much more for you, but you are not willing to leave it. You are like, no, 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 this is it. It's not great, but it's something. And you are stuck in a spiritual level where God's like, no, I want to take you to the next level. But to go to the next level... For your faith to grow, you got to go. You have to be willing to go. You see, he was willing. He went. 
this is potentially dangerous, potentially reckless, but he went. Many people would say, man, this guy's been through enough. Why would Jesus just heal him right there? Why are you going to make him do that? Come on, Jesus, have a heart. And Jesus is like, no, no, no. I have a plan in all of this. And his plan is not just to help this man, but to help every man and woman in this room. He wants to show you something, but faith initiates. You see, you want a Christian life that's this great Christian life, but you don't want to ever have to use faith. You don't want to ever have to get to the point where you're like, God, I do not see the bottom. I'm just going to jump, and I'm going to see what you're going to do. I'm going to bet the farm. I'm going to go big, and I'm going to give it all away. My Oma was one of the first people to financially give to our church each and every month on a fixed income. Can I tell you how many missionaries, church planters, pastors, and just people she was supporting on her own as a single woman on social security? There wasn't some fat retirement that she got. There wasn't, oh, she got this nice little $225 million golden parachute like the guys over at Twitter just got. No, she didn't get that from Briggs and Stratton. They didn't even give her a lawnmower when she retired. Nothing. She gave away her house. She gave away all her money. She died with nothing. She said, I don't want anything left. My kids don't need a retirement. I'm going to give it all away. And that's how she lived. She said, one of you just put me up in your house. I'm just, I'm just going to go and I'm just going to be reckless with my faith. And I know that scares us, but we're never going to have the impact that we'd love to have. And we're never going to have the impact that we'd love to see unless you and I are willing to say, hey, my faith is going to go alone. And understand this, a faith that will not go alone is not actually faith. Your faith has to be willing to say, yeah, let's go. Let's do this. Let's be willing to step out. As a church, God is building our faith. And I'll tell you this, before he builds that building, he's going to build your faith. Because you don't have the $10 million and I don't have the $10 million that's going to take to build that. So God's like, I got to build you first. I know the $10 million is out there. I just know it. I'm hoping somebody sticks a shovel in the ground and up comes that, like, the hillbilly, Beverly Hillbillies, man. That's what I'm hoping. Matter of fact, we should just do that. Just start digging around in our dirt. I don't know if we own the mineral rights, but hey, let's try. We'll get a bunch of oil out real quick before they find out. You see... Your faith, it's scary. It's scary. How slow do you think it took this guy to get to the pool of Siloam? I bet you it took him a long time. How many times have you ever asked yourself, man, I just wish my marriage was here. I wish my kids were here. I wish my career was here. I wish my church was here. I wish this was here. Can I tell you, faith is slow. But it's worth it. It's worth it. I sat down with my aunt and uncle, who, by the way, is Filipino. I didn't know my, I have a German uncle who married a Filipina back before it was even cool. Yeah, I said it. I said it. It's just, it's in right now. The white people, we got to be careful now. We don't want to be known as like uh, unadvertently racist. So, you know, we got to do what we can. Just, just thought I'd throw that out there. But understand this. Their marriage has made it over 50 years. And I'm like, that to me is awesome. How did that happen? He's like, I don't know. She's crazy. I live up there. She lives over there. But we married. I was like, yeah, I want that. That would be cool. That's cool. You see, we want things that we think can just happen right away. But I'm telling you, it doesn't happen like that, does it? Your faith has to grow. And it takes time. And you want to rush the process. And nothing happens fast your bank account didn't build overnight your marriage didn't get strong overnight it takes time our church is getting stronger and stronger you say well what about that family what about that family yeah i know that's hard but god is still building us stronger and stronger the trees go through the fire they get stronger and i love this he went secondly he washed you say, why would you put that in there? He washed. Well, I like it because if you've got mud in your eye, my tendency would be to do this. I don't need to wait to the Siloam pool. My tendency would be like, hey, this guy put something in my eyes. 
you have some water? I need a, I'm a blind guy. This, this guy put stuff in my eye, and I'm blind. Do you have something? Can you, can you wipe it out of my eye? I fix my own problems. But he didn't do that, did he? You know how irritating it is to have something on your face? Some of us, we get just an eyelash, and you're like, ha, ha, oh my goodness, I got an eyelash. What am I going to do with an eyelash? Somebody blow in my eye, I think that's the weirdest thing. People are like, yeah, just blow in my eye real quick. <laughs> COVID, yes. <laughs> Man, right in the eyeball, got it. Excellent. What about this one, just for good measure? It's crazy, right? You get something in your eye, you want it out. But he doesn't do it. He watched. He waited. He was saying, hey, I'm going to go through whatever God you want me to go through. I'm going to wait to clean it. And when it's clean, it'll get clear. And then he was converted. But here's the crazy thing. Here's what's crazy. I know we got to go. I know we got to go. Did Jesus guarantee that he would ever get his sight? Did Jesus ever say he would get his sight if he did it? It's not in your Bible. It's not there. Jesus never said, if you go through all of this, a man who has suffered, a man who has gone through all the pain of being blind, of all the ridicule. If the disciples thought he was a bad sinner, it was cultural. Everybody thought he was a bad sinner. And if they think you're a bad sinner, do you think they're going to open up their wallets and give to you? No, they think you deserve that. They think you did something, so they're not going to give you any money. And in comes Jesus doesn't want to discuss or debate his issue. Jesus just said, I'm going to put some mud on his eyes and go and wash in the pool of Siloam. And here he was like, I could die in the process. I could slip on some steps, steps fall and break my neck. I could get lost. I could end up outside the city and not know how to get back. I could get uh, beat up. Somebody could take what little I have. But through all of it, I love this. The end of verse 7 says he came back seen. He went, he washed, and it worked. It worked. Your faith works if you'll work it. Some of you don't know how strong your faith is because you've never worked it. You've never put yourself in that point where you're like, okay, God, this is the abyss, and I'm about to jump off. And I believe that you're going to catch me. And I believe that you are going to do something. And here's what's crazy, church. He didn't even know Jesus was really the Son of God when he did all this. You say, how do you know that? I know. We're running out of time. Notice if you would, verse number 17. Then the Pharisees again questioned the man who had been born blind and demanded, what is your opinion about the man who healed you? The man replied, what did he say? I was not there. I think he must be a prophet. Did he say, oh, the man who healed me is Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the long-awaited Savior, the one that has been prophesied throughout our Old Testament scriptures, the one that we have waited for. He is the Lamb of God that's going to take away the sins of the world. Is that what he said? He wasn't even sure about who Jesus was, and he still got a miracle. Some of you feel like, no, 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 I got to be sure about this thing, man. I got to be 100% before I do this. And because you feel like you got to be 100%, you've done nothing. February 20th, 2009, I stood at a little waiting room before I walked out to seal the deal and make it legal that Jane and I were going to be married for the rest of our lives. And up until that point, I was so happy. But immediately in that room, I was like, oh my goodness. Ooh, a little, little anxiety. I was like, I gotta, whew, I'm gonna take a knee because I'm gonna pass out. Uh, it hit me. I'd known this woman for four and a half years. We met in 2005. And some of you are gonna think, like, what were you like? Children, you got married? She was 23, I was 25. And some of you were like, are you kidding me? You can't even drive. Like, what in the world? And I was like, I'm gonna be responsible for this woman for the rest of my life? What am I thinking? I just work at some church in San Jose. And you know what I thought? I was like, I bet you Jane's in the back waiting to walk through the doors. And I bet she was thinking, 
I have to take care of that guy for the rest of my life. <laughs> and I was like, I don't even really know her. She says she's from the Philippines. How do I know? I didn't do a background check. I, if I'm lying, I'm dying. I, this thoughts were going through my mind in the back. We're about to walk out. Pastor Larry Obero is about to walk us out. My best man, Brandon, he sees me. I'm going white, whiter than I already am. And he's like, you okay, man? I was like, not really. I'm having like this little inner dialogue. Really, hold on, you know? And it was really going back and forth because I was like, I really don't know Jane. I don't. And I told Pastor Obero, I was like, this is kind of crazy. I'm so young. I haven't really spent any time. We haven't. We, nowadays, it's different. We always had to have a chaperone anywhere we went. We didn't go on any trips without a chaperone. We didn't even go on an overnight. I was like, I've never been on an overnight with her. What if she murders me in my sleep? What if she's crazy? What if she really doesn't like me? And then Pastor Barrow said, you don't get it. You get the next 50 years to learn all of that. And that's the exciting part. It's that rush. I'm saying, this is the unknown. This is where God's going to show up and show off in every little argument, in every crisis, in every financial setback, in all the good and in all the bad and the sickness and, and everything that's going to go on. There's going to be that person that's right there, and you're going to get to see another dimension of who, how amazing this person is and how faith-filled and how godly and how much they're willing to sacrifice everything to do the most crazy things for the kingdom of God. They're willing to bet the farm. And nowadays, I look back 14 years later and I'm like if I could have gone in a time machine I would have told Micaiah in 2009 stop thinking run to that stage and say yes get out there because that's the best thing that's ever going to happen to you and right now I'm telling you if your future self could come back in time into this service right now they would grab you by the nap of your neck and say the thing that you are debating and discussing do it the best life is on the other side of that faith move. The best life is on the other side of you saying yes to Jesus and saying yes to all that I am and receiving all that he is. The best part of your life is on the other side of what you see now. Right now all you see is this scary precipice where you're about to leap off and you know that God has created you for more. He put destiny in your heart. He put purpose inside of you and you're standing at the edge and Satan is trying to get you to have this dialogue with yourself and Jesus Jesus is like, stop debating and make a difference in the city of San Jose. Make a difference in Santa Clara County. Make a difference in your neighborhood. Make a difference in your college. Make a difference in your marriage. Make a difference in the lives of your children. It's never too late because you ain't dead. You got breath in your chest. It's not too late to pick up the phone. It's not too late to send a text message. It's not too late to get things right. It's not too late. God's saying, just jump and I'm there and your faith is going to flourish. Your faith is going to take you places. And one day you're going to look back and you'll be like, thank you, God, that I was willing. And I had a pastor that continued to encourage me to take big steps of faith. We don't take little baby steps. We take giant leaps of faith where we say, God, we're going to build this building for $10 million. God, we're going to reach San Jose for Christ. So build the auditorium as big as it can be. Because there was a guy who was in our church two weeks ago. His name was Brian. First time he came. And he was interviewed in a video. And he said this in the video. Brought tears to my eyes. He said, they need to build the biggest building they can because San Jose is a big city and all of San Jose needs to fit inside their building. God is at work but if you and I are just going to be like the disciples and just debate it you're going to miss out on something. You're going to miss out. You're going to be like those ten virgins. Five were ready and five weren't. They missed out on a dinner with the king. Don't miss out, my friend. Are you feeling FOMO? I want you to feel some FOMO right now. I don't want you to miss out on the best part of what God is about to do in our city. And he's going to do it not through just me, but he wants to do it through each and every one of you. 
So how about we bet the farm? How about we go big? How about we say, God, what do you got for me? I don't care how old or how young or what experience or inexperience I have. I'm going all out because any risk is worth taking if it's, worth, if it's for the kingdom of God. It's worth it. And we'll look back. And we'll see like my Oma did. Because as my dad stood there, he said, Oma wrote this funeral. Everything we do is because she planned it. And we're going to do it exactly how she wanted it. And everything had to do with faith. Everything was about faith. Her faith carried her. She never remarried. Never had a second income. Raised four children. All of them graduated from college. She has like more grandkids than this homeschooler can count. She went big. You and I, the blind man saw more than we've ever seen. The blind man saw more than we've ever seen. He said, this guy, I, I don't know who he is. There's something different about him. And he didn't even have eyes that could see it. He just knew it. What about if your barista says there's something different about you? Your coworker says something different about you. I don't need eyes to see it. I know it. Can we all stand with heads bowed and eyes closed? There's a change that God wants to bring in your life. His neighbors and friends debated whether this really was even the blind man. I want to see a change so radical and so dynamic and so different in your life and the life of those residents in San Jose that people say, that's not the same person. So stop debating, deciding, delaying if you're going to make a difference. You are called to a purpose. And a blind man, he went, he washed, and it worked. You can do it because a blind man did it. A man with a severe disability, he did it. I have no excuse. With heads bowed and eyes closed, maybe the Holy Spirit right now is prompting you to take the first big step in your life. That is to initiate faith. The man was healed, not because he washed, but because he went. That's where the healing came. When he stepped out. This morning, I believe Jesus Christ is speaking to hearts right now. You say... I know that I've accepted Christ as my Savior. I know if I were to spend eternity in heaven right now, that I know I'm saved. I know I'm going to heaven. I know that. You say, I, that's me. Would you slip up your hand and say, yes, I know that I'm going to heaven. May I see your hands? Oh, amen. Praise God. Thank you. you put your hands down. I love it when I see hands raised. But when I see hands that couldn't be raised, man, my heart breaks for you. This morning, the greatest invitation awaits you. And it's the invitation to receive Jesus Christ, your personal Lord and Savior. Behold, I stand at the door and knock, and if any man hears, let him open, and I will come in unto him. God is knocking at your door right now of your heart, and he's saying, let me into your life. You say, today, I want to receive Christ as my Savior. Is that you? You say, yes, I want to receive Christ as my Savior. Would you slip your hand up? Can we pray for you? Is that you? You say, I want to say yes to Jesus today. At any point in the service. Amen. I see that hand. Any others? Here's what we're going to do. Let's pray together. We're going to pray out loud for the benefit of those who are coming to Jesus. Would you please just repeat after me? Dear God, there are things that don't work in my life. And I am willing to let go of them so I can be cleansed from my sin and accept you as my Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. Did you pray that prayer? Would you slip up your hand? Is that you? You prayed that prayer this morning? Amen. If you prayed that prayer, our ushers, we want to get you a Bible. If you prayed that prayer, we got a Bible for you. We believe that this begins a journey for you. Also, if you're planning to get baptized, we invite you right now to slip out, and we're going to, you can get prepared to be baptized. We have some that are going to get baptized. So right now you could slip out, start getting changed. You say, you know what? I need to get baptized. Well, you can slip out right now. And uh, you, you, you can grab a bag. We got all different sizes where you could take that next step of faith. And you say, yeah, I need to get baptized. If that's you, you can slip out right now. And we'd love for you to get baptized. You say, I didn't, I didn't come to get baptized, but I'd like to. Well, on the back table is all the different sizes. And you could take that step this morning.
Let me pray, and then we're going to worship the Lord together, and we'll close the service. Heavenly Father, we thank you for what you're doing in our midst. Lord, would you continue to work? Father, I just pray that you'd bless this invitation time. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.